Hi, Robin. Hey, Anne. It's great to talk to you again. We nice spoke, to talk to you. We spoke last August, if I remember correctly. So it's been a while, but uh, there's lots of fashion things and, and lots of news that we can talk about. I guess I should make it clear that uh, I'm Anne Althaus of the University of Wisconsin Law School in the blog Althaus, and you're Robin Gavon. You want exactly. to reintroduce people? The Washington Post. That's right. And, uh, and you specialize in fashion, but we'll, we'll try to branch out into politics and culture and the like, okay? Okay. Which you specialize in, too. I thought we, we should start with the sad news uh, this morning that George Carlin died, the great comedian. I have felt he was the best comedian ever since I first started watching him on TV back in, I guess it was the 1970s. So I've just loved him for years. I've seen him in concert. I've watched all of, not, maybe not all, he's done so many HBO specials, but I've watched many of those. And I just think he's great. And, you know, there's tons of his stuff on YouTube. So you can go into YouTube and search on the different topics, like, uh, uh, and get clips of him speaking about just all manner of topic. It's just uh, wonderful to have YouTube to go back to find. But it's very, very sad that he died. He was, uh, he was 71. I think he had a heart condition. And it's, it's really, really sad to lose him. I know you don't really. Well, I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna have to go back to. Uh, I'm gonna have to go to YouTube and review. Now, some it, it can be hard. Some of his recent stuff, or in the last ten years or so, can be very angry and harsh. So that if you agree with him politically, it might not seem that uh, difficult to watch if you're used to rough language. Yeah. Uh, but uh, it, it's very tough for a lot of people to watch the, the late stuff. A lot of the early stuff is is very charming, very smart, you know, just brilliant riffs. When I uh, saw this morning, when I got up and saw that he had died, you know, that I started to think about the blog post I'd put together, and the first thing I thought about was this great uh, old uh, uh, bit that he did about uh, stuff, about the, the meaning of life is finding a place to put your stuff, and then he just riffs on the whole subject about, you know, if we... If we didn't have stuff, uh, we wouldn't need a house. We wouldn't need a job. And I mean, I can't repeat it, but I, I can give you the link to the uh, to the clip. And so, uh, you know, if you remember any old uh, riff of his, and you search in YouTube, uh, you know, you're likely to be able to find it. So, but yeah, uh, but you didn't I, really watch his uh, HBO shows and things like that. I'm sorry. Uh, you, did, you didn't watch the HBO specials? He did the best. He's done way more no, HBO comedy specials I, than anyone I have else. I to admit, and this might get me, get my, you know, pop culture aficionado card revoked or something, but I just, I just never found him really funny. Uh -huh. Sorry. I thought you were going to say you didn't get HBO. <laughs> that would shock no, me. No, no, I think no, you no, would no. have your card revoked. One <laughs> must have HBO. But I guess right. I think I need to go back and you know do and and hear the seven naughty words that you're not supposed to say on television. Yeah, everybody's and then I talking. Might appreciate him a little bit more. It, it's it, either many versions of that riff. Uh, he started out with seven, and then somebody told him that one of, one of the words on the list was a, a duplicate because he had the F word, and then also mother. <laughs> mm -mm. Uh, and so then he, then he has a whole riff about how there's a duplication there. You know, he has a lot of riffs about other subjects. For example, there's one that I love about the Ten Commandments where he talks about how there's a lot of duplication in there. Yeah. And, they, and that you can tell they were made up by people because, um, because they came up with ten. Like they were sitting around trying to think about how they could uh, pass this off on people. And they uh, decided, you know, it had to be ten because that would sound authoritative and so on. And then he goes through basically saying where all the repetitions are. I don't th he may get it down to one. I forget. But now, uh, Do you think uh, that he has any <laughs> particular air in the world of comedy? Anyone who sort of picked up the mantle oh. where he left off? I don't, I think a lot of comedians are, maybe all of these angry guys who yell about politics yeah. have some connection to him. But like maybe uh, you know, Lewis Black? Just, yeah, but you know, those people are so much less dimensional than he was. He had just mm -hmm. a lot of things. A lot of it seemed intellectual. There was a lot about language. Some of the best ones are just about words. So I think people who don't like the things about sex or politics yeah. could get involved in the ones that are about words or about just little things about people that's more observational but you know so you could say that's sort of like Seinfeld except Seinfeld wouldn't go into the political stuff like he did so I think he had a kind of a range of things that he could do mm -hmm. and he just seemed like he was smarter than the, than those other comedians uh, and and just had more more dimension to him he worked really hard on uh, on writing all the time, wrote a lot of books. And there was an interview in the New York Times with him from a year or so ago about uh, basically how he didn't have any hobbies, he didn't have any interests, he just sat at his computer and wrote all the time. So 
That sounds feel, like feel a, affinity that sounds for that. a little sad. That's what I do. <laughs> well, but then he got on stage and did his thing. Uh, he had a. I mean, was he, he was married a, a couple. Stage guy, or did he ever do any films? Oh, he's in some films. He plays a. Oh, I wish I could remember. I have to look it up on IMDb to see that. But he plays a, a hippie in, in in some film, or he he could be like a certain kind of a comic character, and he has been in a number of films. So, uh, yeah, and, and I think he did some TV as well. I'm not being very authoritative on that. I'm <laughs> sorry, but I wanted to help you out by connecting it to fashion, because I think there's a fashion topic on the subject of George Carlin, uh, and that is that. Uh, Oh, uh, if you read the obituary in the New York Times today, it said Mm -hmm. that uh, he kind of had this transformation in about 1970 when he realized he was being sort of a conventional comedian, more like Bob Hope or somebody like that, I guess. And he wore a suit and tie, and he uh, made jokes to businessmen, and then he uh, made a transformation where he switched to uh, got rid of the suit Mm -hmm. and the clean-cut image, you know, and he got the beard and the long hair, the jeans... And then he also transformed his routine into the, the more edgy, uh, you know, hipster kind of things that he did for the rest of his life. So he, he put the suit behind. And we talked about suits back uh, last August. He put the suit behind. He adopted sort of a hippie uh, style of dress with the jeans. And then in the last uh, decade or so, he's had just this all-black outfit, the long-sleeved black uh, T-shirt and then black plain black pants. And I thought to... There's some kind of a trend among a certain sort of man, like I was thinking about Steve Jobs, who always has a similar kind of uh, long sleeve black top all the time. Well, you, know, you might have something, <laughs> any interpretation of what it means <laughs> for these. Uh, for, well, I guess to put the suit aside, and then also there was the old uh, jeans approach to dressing, and then there's this thing from the last uh, decade or so of, of men and men dressing like stagehands or something. In black. Well, you know, usually these guys, these stand-up comics, I mean, they, they wear something that either contradicts what they're all about or plays into it. It mm-hmm. seems to me that you, know, you, I think, put it most succinctly. He decided that he didn't want to be perceived as this establishment guy and, mm-hmm. you know, put on clothes that back in the day were sort of, were very uh, sort of bohemian and, you know, sort of hipster clothes. Now, though, I think... It's, it's all sort of, clearly, it had all caught up with him. I mean, it's just as establishment to be wearing, you know, a black turtleneck and a pair of black trousers. Um, yeah. I mean, I seem to recall, you know, presidential candidates wearing, you know, black turtlenecks and plain trousers. So it's not oh, who wore black? Who did that? Which, which, candidate, wore, which candidate wore a black turtleneck? I remember this from um, the last election with Wesley Clark. And there were two of them. I can't remember the other one, but uh, yeah. both Wes Clark and a second candidate. Maybe it was Dennis Kucinich. They were doing, I want to say, like an MTV debate or something like that. And that was supposed to be their uh, sort of business casual, I'm hanging with the young people look. <laughs> when they go on MTV. Well, um, I-, I find it hard to picture voting for a presidential candidate who wore a black turtleneck. That just doesn't seem right. <laughs> What, you think he might be smoking closed cigarettes in secret or something? You don't know. It just seems like he's not ready. I, I, I think the president needs to wear a suit. There's this idea that, uh, you know, uh, they always talk about how Reagan always put on a jacket before he went in the Oval Office and so on. There's something symbolic about that that's important. Uh, but, I mean, I think maybe the day will come when they'll, when, when they'll wear their black uh, turtlenecks. I mean, I, I think it's very interesting that Steve Jobs always wears that same outfit and it's almost become sort of a joke. Like I've seen cartoons of a closet full of, you know, black turtlenecks and then on the second row, je- jeans is what he wears on, on the bottom. Well, I mean, I think that, you know, it's one thing for uh, a president to put on the suit when it's appropriate or certainly going into the Oval Office. But I think they often, mm-hmm. certainly candidates and presidents get into trouble when they're in a suit in situations where they just sort of look like they're completely out of touch with, the surroundings yeah. and the people that they're talking yeah. to. Like Nick, Nixon famously walked on the beach in a suit. Exactly. And even Barack that, that Obama d- got a hard time for, you know, playing <laughs> yeah. for bowling and still right. wearing his tie. And he got also a lot of uh, people laughed at him for the way he dressed when he went out on his bike. <laughs> what did you think of that picture? That was a very funny picture, but it disturbed me mostly because it was obvious that the bike wasn't adjusted to his height, so it, it didn't look it didn't look normal on the bike. Well, 
It also had a flat tire. He, well, he, well, I didn't notice that it had a flat tire, but he, you know, he didn't look like he was uh, one of these guys who was out to do some serious mileage. I, mean, I don't think he was. Yeah. I don't think his pedal. He was clipped into his pedals or anything like that. I, I think uh-huh. the problem is that you know he was wearing the the shirt tucked in. Um, I seem to recall. But, you know, I suppose better that than, you know, in the full spandex gear with logos on the side and a, you know, packet of goo in his back pocket. Oh, that wouldn't have gone <laughs> over well. That would have been worse. I mean, they, they want to be shown as sportsmen, but they get into more trouble with the sportsmen pictures. You know, Carrie with his dead duck and, uh, and, and the windsurfing. Carrie got in a lot of trouble uh, trying to look like a sportsman. Although he probably was kind of a sportsman. Yeah, I mean, Kerry is very athletic, and he's a serious biker as well. So I don't think it's a matter of they sort of looking awkward when you're doing the sport. I think a lot of times what happens is that, you know, the gear for a lot of these sports is not exactly right. the most, um, sometimes it's not that familiar to people, and sometimes it's not exactly something that makes you look authoritative. You know, I don't right. think anyone looks particularly authoritative when they're hopping on a bike. I know. You know, here in Madison, we have a lot of cops on bikes, and, and, and then they'll wear shorts, too. And I just feel like, right. how can a cop ride a bike and, and wear shorts? How can that well, work? I mean, isn't, I mean, I always thought that a lot of times they put cops on bikes and also on rollerblades, for instance, because the idea is to make them more accessible and to have yeah. people feel a little less intimidated by their neighborhood yeah. cops. So there yeah, is I think that's like the an inherent element of informality and approachability in a lot of that gear. Not exactly. Because they're person. trying to take away the authority. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. There's some places I think the cops go on segways. That would be very hard to take seriously. <laughs> For some reason, I think I've actually seen cops on segways in Washington, but maybe that was just a bad dream that I was having. <laughs> It's really funny. You hardly ever see anyone on a Segway. I mean, they just didn't catch on, but they do look so funny that it's, it's always funny. <laughs> but uh, to see a cop on a Segway, it does uh, undermine their authority. But so, so do you think there's any meaning to this uh, this sort of sleek black uh, look that uh, uh, that certain male, uh, well, like authority figures, to, to mention Steve Jobs. I mean, the, you know, he, he's a person of high prestige. And, uh, you know, he has this classic uniform. I was thinking that that might be the, the male uniform of the future to replace the suit. Um, you know, I think a lot of it has to do with people wanting to look like they're not part of the establishment, that they have the ability mm-hmm. to think creatively. But yeah. truthfully, I, just, I don't think the suit is ever going to be replaced. I mean, yeah. it has been around forever in almost the exact same form. And every year, there's always some designer who comes along and tries to, quote-unquote, reinvent yeah. the suit. And yeah. they tweak it. They make the pants a little shorter. They make the sleeves a little higher. They change the lapel. But the reality is that it is, I think, it's a perfect uniform. Why muck you know, with perfection? I think that the Steve Jobs thing and the George Carlin look is it is really classic, and I like it, but it's actually limited to someone who stays lean. Um, and so the suit is a way of kind of creating a, an image of slimness, whereas the, the Steve Jobs approach is, is exclusive. You know, a suit could be very expensive and exclusive because of that, but the, there's the exclusivity of needing to be uh, slim to wear that black look. Well, I think it has to do with a sense of youthfulness. You know, I mean, there's, as you said, I mean, it requires kind of a a lean, youthful figure in order to pull it off. And a Mm -hmm. suit, a man's suit, can hide a multitude of sins. Yes, I I remember interviewing this this, uh, this tailor who had a shop on Savile Row in London. And he was Mm -hmm. exaggerating, of course, but, you know, in talking about his ability to tailor to any man's shape, he basically said, you know, I can tailor a suit for a coffee table and make it look spectacular. <laughs> I was also thinking that the, the all-black look is a way of sort of blending into the background, like that's what a stagehand would wear. And, I mean, I dress like that sometimes when I'm teaching just because I want to, I don't want to be the body. I want the focus to be, you know, on my face or I have something to say. And it's a basically kind of a way of saying, you know, I'm a brain, I'm not a body at all. 
Well, I, I think in different situations, it's, it sort of sends a different message. Certainly with the stage hands, it is a way of just kind of disappearing into the background. Mm -hmm. And I think a, mm -hmm. lot of, a lot of women, for instance, uh, tend to rely on all black as a way of just sort of camouflaging themselves. But I think some mm -hmm. people use it as a way of saying that, you know, that, that they're not part of authority and that they want to break that idea down to essentially say, quote, unquote, there aren't any suits in the room and to suggest that mm -hmm. they're more creative, they're more yeah. you know, improvisational. I mean, because it's really, there's a real connection to it with sort of the, the art, the sort of artsy fartsy, you know, part of the culture it has this sort of yeah. boho feeling to it. Beatniks. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I, I like the look for that reason, I think, partly. But, uh, um, you know, uh, Michael Kors on Project Runway was asked at the, uh, you know, the reunion show where they interview each other and so on uh, about why he, he basically dresses exactly the same way as Steve uh, Jobs. Oh, but he puts a jacket over because he actually is a little chubby, so I think he needs the jacket edition. I would uh, never but, uh, call he gave some reason. Kors chubby. <laughs> Whoops. He's perfect. <laughs> He's love. Isn't he a little chubby? I thought that was why he wore the jacket. Well, the jacket camouflaged it, so my opinion is invalid, as I said. I take it all back, Michael. Now I'm afraid he's going to get little... But, but uh, he, I think he said something, you know, why, if you're a fashion designer, would you wear the same thing every day? And he had some sort of answer, which I guess, I don't know what it was. Well, he's, not, he's certainly not the only fashion designer who does that. I mean, a lot of them have mm -hmm. their uniform. And I think of Giorgio Armani. You know, he's like the dark mm -hmm. pants and the fitted T-shirt that, you know, sometimes it's mm -hmm. white, sometimes it's navy, but it's, you know, it's his uniform. And for a good long time, Tom Ford had a uniform, which was a black suit with an open collar white shirt. And, you know, I yeah. think for some of them, it's this idea that, um, you know, they're just, they're sort of evolved beyond clothing. <laughs> That they have. Well, it's funny that they're selling clothes, and yet they're setting an example which you could say, hey, why don't I do what they do? I could just wear a black shirt and jeans yeah, on. Yeah, and, and there are definitely looks some cool. designers who, you know, spent a lot of time thinking about that, that moment when they come out on the runway and what they're going to be wearing and how they want it to be creative and dramatic and all those kinds of things. But I think for a lot of them, it's... You know, it's a sense that this is their job, and they take this very seriously. And in many ways, mm -hmm. it's almost like, you know, a doctor coming out in, in the white medical jacket or, or yeah. an artist coming yeah. out in the artist's smock. There's a sense of, you know, <laughs> this is, I've been, wor I've been working really hard backstage putting together this incredible creative collection. All of my creativity <laughs> went down the runway. There was none left to dress myself. Right, right. Yeah, I'm just working so hard on all of this. Well, I, I like the idea that artists today actually still wear those smocks and, and like, berets and carry the palette. <laughs> <with> the <laughs> you ever see those people? Wouldn't it be funny if you met an artist and he really was dressed yeah, like sure that? Japanese but, uh, that all the time. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we'll have to check this out. Um, uh, I wanted to ask you about, uh, let's talk about women. Um, mm -hmm. uh, Michelle Obama and the... Uh, the sleevelessness, yeah. you know. I, I thought it was funny because Slade has a current article uh, about how the designers are currently obsessed with sleeves, which I, I think is sort of an amusing concept. But I guess, you know, you move around to the different parts yeah. of the body and become obsessed with them sequentially. But this is exactly at the I have to admit that I don't know that I buy fully into that argument, but that's just me. <laughs> Did you buy like, like there was this theory that uh, that the designers have to move to different body parts and that there are shifting erogenous zones and it just happens to be arms right now? You know, I don't know that I I can't really see arms as erogenous erogenous zones. I think that <laughs> you know designers spent a lot of time playing around with silhouette and certainly sleeves. You know, the sleeve is a really key focal point of any garment, and you can, can spend a lot of time playing with that and dramatically mm -hmm. shift the way that, you know, a simple black dress looks, yeah. depending on whether or not it's got, you know, these really tight, high armholes or butterfly kinds of sleeves. Yeah. So it's definitely a way of completely shifting the look of something. 
But whenever I, you know, talk to designers about sleeves versus, you know, sleevelessness, mm -hmm. for them it's always this kind of battle with their customer. Their customer wants their arms covered. The designers want to do sleeveless. I've never noticed that designers are trying to help out women who, who are too fat. We'd say that again? doesn't seem to me that designers are that interested in helping out women who are too fat. So why would this, why would uh, they help them out on the sleeve issue? Well, it's not so much a matter of being overweight for a lot of women. And some of them, you know, I'm talking women who are barely out of their 20s. Mm -hmm. They have issues with their arms and they don't like, they don't necessarily like showing them. Yeah. And reality for a lot of designers is that, you know, the person who, the woman who's going to go and buy one of their evening gowns, the one mm -hmm. who's going to these charity events or yeah. who has all these cocktail parties to go to, is an older woman. And many of them, the vast majority of them, say that they want something covering their arms. So, so it's this... not about being overweight. It's more a matter of age and tone and and just feeling uncomfortable. Well, now, I think that one thing about, and so, so Michelle Obama with the bare arms is sort of, it's sort of like the young women with their bare midriffs. It's something that only some people can wear, so you have this sort of pride in your ability to wear it. Well, I would argue that, you know, even if you're over the age of 16, you should probably not be going out in public with a bare midriff, no matter how great right. your midriff looks. But you can go out with bare uh, arms, can't you? <laughs> Oh, absolutely. I mean, I, I personally think the idea that so many women are uncomfortable bearing their arms is just ridiculous. And you don't have to have you know, biceps like Madonna in order to do it. But I do think that one of the things that sort of strikes a lot of people about Michelle Obama when she wears these sleeveless shifts mm -hmm. is the fact that she does have strikingly toned arms. Yes. And I think it sort of conjures up these ideas about youthfulness and also strength. I mean, she looks like she has the arms of an athlete. And it also just looks real sleek and modern, and it evokes Jackie Kennedy and the 60s, the sort of sheath dress that was so simple, and uh, it just seems really spiffy and, and, and interesting and exciting, I think. Well, I, th I do think that the idea of it evoking a certain you know, modern way of dressing is, is definitely key because it's so because it's not fussy, and it's mm -hmm. not a suit, and it's very spare, and mm -hmm. it does have this kind of, you know, almost aerodynamic sensibility to it. I mean, it's a very, yeah. it's a very sleek, clean way of dressing. Do, do people still say A-line dress? I remember in the 60s, we were always wearing A-line dresses, and it was seemed to be just the, that the, the dress had been refined into this sort of simple uh, concept in the early 60s, like yeah, with Jackie sure, Kennedy. It sure. seemed like the, the pinnacle had been so reached. The, the A-line dress. And, yeah. you know, the other thing, too, is that if there has been one fashion trend that has sort of swept through the women's market over the last year or more, it's been mm -hmm. the return of the dress. Yeah. So yeah. I mean, that, that's another thing that's quite noticeable. And to me, it's also a bit surprising when you think about uh, the most recent first ladies, I mean, Laura Bush and, uh, and Hillary Clinton, were not really known for wearing dresses. I mean, they wore suits. Yeah. So if, uh, so if the Obamas... Another... Go ahead. No, I was just going to say, so that, you know, I think is another element that makes what she wears a bit striking in, in the sense that it looks so modern. Yeah. And, you know, I think you look at her and you're trying to figure out what is it about what she has on that makes her stand out. And, yeah. it's, you know, the, it's the, the sum total of all these little things. The fact that it's a dress and not a suit. The fact that it's a form-fitting dress, one mm -hmm. that shows her curves. The fact that it's a sleeveless yeah. dress. You know, yeah. All those things make it stand out in, I think, subtle ways. Now, did you see her on The View? I did. She had I that did. black and dress, and she identified the store. Where, yeah, you could go out and buy that dress. It's sort of like everybody could. This dress looked fabulous, and then she reveals that you know you could have this dress for one hundred forty dollars. So, yeah, I, thought I was, it was so a really smart move. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, well, everything was really well done about that show, I thought. Although, uh, you know, this issue of uh, women's arms, Sherry Shepard, who's one of the women on The View, uh, was yeah. sitting next to Michelle uh, Obama, asked her about the dress and said, you know, they talked about all oh, but you were smiling nonstop throughout the entire show. <laughs> weren't they all? I think they were all in love with her, uh, including Elizabeth Hasselbeck. Uh, who uh, didn't want anyone to think that she didn't like her. But uh, but uh, Sherry Shepard, who's pretty uh, heavy, um, uh, was saying, oh, you know, you can wear those uh, that sleeveless dress, but I have flabby arms. And she pointed at them, and she was not wearing something completely sleeveless, but her arms were partially bare, and she completely pointed at them and said they were flabby. So I guess it is uh, okay to do You know, ever since I've watched that show, I've started to keep these... Uh, five pound weights on my desk and I'm always sitting at the computer all day long. But now, you know, as I'm sitting at the computer, I, uh, I do, uh, I pick up my weights and, and multitask because I want to have arms like Michelle Obama. Well, I think I know it's impossible. Kind of one of the other things about the arms and for a lot of, for a lot of women who work out every day, I mean, in order to have arms like that, you specifically have to work your, you have to work out your arms. And, yes, and and I think that's kind of an, another sort of pronouncement, for lack of a better word. So it seems like you, you have to be a person of leisure. Know this is someone who pays attention, right? Or that has enough leisure to put a lot of time into her um, appearance. In fact, that was a subject they specifically talked about at exactly that point on the view. Uh, they 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 segued right from that topic of uh, the sleeplessness to the topic of all the time it takes for a woman to get ready. And it really, I think, it was throwing a line to the viewer, basically saying, "Oh, but don't expect yourself to be able to do all of this." Michelle Obama has lots of people helping her, and she puts a lot of time into how she looks. You and know, uh, you know, I mean, you don't I really just, have I to aspire to this. I don't buy that. I mean, this whole business where women are like, "Oh my God, I." I don't have time to, you know, right. pull it together in the morning. I mean, come on. I mean, how much time does it take to put on a dress right. instead of, right. you know, a well, a dress sweat should, suit? If you have your dresses, you put the dress, everything is done. You don't have to collect things and figure out what goes together. So a dress really should be the ultimate simplification. And I'm here to tell you that you should just keep five-pound weights by your computer, that you don't have to go anywhere. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> But, uh, yeah, so, uh, but, uh, uh, oh, you wanted to talk about, uh, let me see, Cindy McCain. You have uh, to well, talk about the other uh, candidate's uh, wife. And I, you wrote I, an I interesting column about... I bit to write, to talk about Cindy McCain. <laughs> oh, you're talking to talk about Cindy McCain. But uh, you wrote a, a, a nice uh, uh, column about uh, both of the candidates' wives uh, mm -hmm. as they appeared, as they were transformed by Vogue. Indeed. Indeed, Tell the entire that. Vogue village had at them. And, um, you know, what was just striking to me is, is the fact that the Michelle Obama's photographs were quite formal. And to me, the idea seemed to be to give the readers uh, a sense of, you know, hey, this is what this woman might look like as First Lady. Sort of getting used mm -hmm. to the idea of envisioning her as First Lady. Whereas with Cindy McCain, I, I think part of the attempt was to take someone who is always, always seen in a very sort of formal way, always perfectly mm -hmm. turned out, and say, look, here's this other side of her, here's this more yeah. informal, this more relaxed, this less, you know, polished uh, version of her. But, you know, mm -hmm. I thought that was, it was almost as, it was just as, you know, forcibly informal yeah, yeah. as as anything Studied, else. Uh, so well but I mean making but isn't that isn't that always the case in fashion photography that they're trying to make people look like they're just running along and something suddenly happened and it's never true. It's just a question of how well you're pulling it off, isn't it? No, absolutely. And I think when you're dealing with professional models or you're dealing with a celebrity who is used you know, an actress who is used to believably mm -hmm. conveying a certain emotion I think it does work more often than not. Yeah. But with, with these images, the, the thing that really struck me about one of the Cindy McCain images in particular was one that she was, she was stretched out on the chaise lounge. And oh, yeah, that's how we'll be able to, to, to see the picture. And, uh, and, and in, when you looked at it, 
it was supposed to be this image of her reclining, <laughs> except she was sitting, when you looked at it, she was sitting in such a way <laughs> that when you thought about it, you're like, that's a really uncomfortable yeah. position. Yeah. That's, you know, that's, that's not just this sort of, you know, flop down onto this chair relaxing. And so clearly she had been positioned in that way with her head just so, so the hair blew just so, mm -hmm. and the arm was resting just so. <laughs> and that, that's what was really striking to me. But isn't everyone who's ever posed on a chaise long, uh, aren't they <laughs> turned around to make their legs look uh, right and they're halfway twisted? And it's just a question of whether you know it, whether something about the person is letting you become aware of that. But it's always true. There's nothing any more uh, phony about her picture being posed than anybody else's. It's just that she looks uncomfortable mm -hmm. enough that you become aware of it, right? Hey, look, if I were being photographed like that, yeah. I would most definitely contort my body however necessary in order to make me look 10 pounds thinner. Yeah. No doubt about it. But So it's not a matter of accusing the photograph of being false. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's nothing um, hap you know, haphazard about a Vogue photograph. I mean, that, no matter who it is. Yeah. It's more a matter of saying, okay, given the village of stylists and hairstylists and makeup artists and a photographer bound and determined to take a spectacular photograph, what's the overall message, implication of the resulting photograph? Mm -hmm. I mean, we're not getting anything that is at all candid. You know, we're not getting a snapshot into someone's soul. We're getting a photograph of the message of the day. So it's what the message that they want to convey, and they may not be able to Absolutely. do it very well, but we at least learn what they're trying to show. I mean, it's a pretty simple thing with her that people see her as sort of cold and icy and stiff and step uh, and she's trying to say that she's not, so that if she still looks stiff even when she has all this professional help, then she really must be that frozen step for this wife. Is well, that what I mean, I was intrigued that? by the image of her recently when she was on, um, I think it was CNN, and she was uh, doing a, a charity uh, philanthropic trip, mm -hmm. um, I think to Vietnam, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. And she was doing the interview. She had a baseball cap. Right. Was kind of pulled back. And a lot was made about how, oh, you know, here was this incredibly relaxed, informal uh, image of Cindy McCain that we're not used to. And all I kept thinking was, yeah, but I mean, she still has on, you know, tons of eye, of, of mascara. I mean, it's not like this woman, you know, came out fully unmade up and sat yeah. down for an interview. I mean, there was still an element of control there. And, it, you know, it still was not completely, you know, candid and, and unchoreographed. And mm -hmm. I, it's not that I necessarily think that that's a bad thing. I just think we have to be careful when you start talking about, oh, you know, here she is with her hair sort of metaphorically down. When, yeah. in fact, you know, it's not really down. But if people are used to seeing you with makeup on, and you're at least of a certain age, uh, if you don't have your makeup on, you look like a homeless person. <laughs> really. <laughs> So, I mean, I think you just, you just can't do I think it. That's, I think that's totally fair. I don't know that any of us really and truly want to see a potential first lady, you know, having just rolled out of bed. I mean, no right. one really wants to see that. No one needs to that's see right. that. I just think that there has there is an understanding that whenever we do see these people, that it's highly unlikely that what we're seeing just sort of is completely unscripted. And I, so that's why I think it's absolutely fair to look at those images and say, hmm, you know, what is, what is this making me, what is this saying to me? What is, what's yeah. the message here? You know, what yeah. am I reading, what kind of reading am I getting from this person based on this image? Now, I thought when Michelle Obama was on The View, she had her hair done in this really nicely tousled way where it looked like that just happened, but it, it couldn't have just happened. Yeah, yeah. It was like probably totally sprayed that, in place uh, to have it. Well, that's like when you talk about, you know, in a, in a beauty magazine, the natural look, where mm -hmm. it looks like you're not wearing any makeup, but it still took you right. an hour to look like you're not wearing any makeup. 
Well, I remember when the natural, natural look first came out, like in the early 70s, and the fashion magazines always said it actually takes more makeup to achieve the natural look. Right. That, that was always the line. is not the same thing <laughs> as no makeup. Well, I, I always thought they were just trying to make sure you knew you had to still buy a lot of stuff. <laughs> don't think you're going to get, but they always they would always say, it "Actually, takes more." <laughs> well, I, I don't know thought that, that it was takes funny. more, but yeah, you know, it's still, it's still about selling a little merch. Y- yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, now you ended your column by talking about Hillary Clinton and how she didn't submit to the Vogue uh, look. Yeah. And do you think that's why she uh, why she lost? Do I think that's or, why um, she lost? Oh, <laughs> or do you think she was just so controlled she couldn't even do the controlled photograph? You know, far wiser, more informed people than me could, you know, try and analyze why she lost. I mean, I do think that, um, you know, it said something about about her campaign and the way that her campaign was thinking about presenting her that... Mm-hmm. She didn't want to submit to the Vogue photo session, something that she had mm-hmm. done as First Lady. Of course, she was the candidate. She wasn't the candidate's wife. So the idea that she would do something frivolous or take the time out from her important schedule to do something like that, maybe, or that she would be grouped with the wives rather than with the uh, with the candidates. You know, I, I, she had I some symbolic reasons not to do it. The idea of, and, and also the wisdom of looking at a fashion magazine and or a woman's magazine and and saying that there's something frivolous about that because you know mm-hmm. talk about sexism in you know in a campaign i mean frankly every time they ask these people these, these they would ask these candidates about you know who you, who do you have in your final four bracket or whatever the heck the thing was i mean i thought that was pretty darn frivolous i mean i don't really care what right. you know, basketball yes. team someone is rooting for. Yeah. And, you know, right. the idea we talked about this in August. I... We talked about this last August. I just rewatched the old video. This subject came up then. Yeah, so the idea that she would, that there might have been some sense of not wanting to be perceived as frivolous because she was mm-hmm. being photographed in a fashion magazine. Yeah. I think that certainly reeks of a kind of sexism that is very uh, yeah. obsolete. And it's just now, I, I really think it's true, and it's important for people to learn, especially for men to learn, that fashion is exactly as important as sports. This is, it, it's as interesting to people. It's as frivolous or not frivolous. It's like sports. So if it's you know, like they sports, should be seen it's as like fancy cars. It's, you know, whatever you spend your disposable income on, it's mm-hmm. whatever you use as a way of sort of announcing to the world, this is who I am. You know, there mm-hmm. are those people who go, I'm a, you know, driver of four trucks versus those who say, yeah. I'm a sports car kind of guy. Mm-hmm. Now, um, I thought she actually looked really great whenever she was on a... Um, Doing a speech that was televised or in any Hillary of the debates, mean? Hillary Clinton. Mm-hmm. I thought uh, the lighting, the makeup, the hair. It, mm-hmm. She really, really looked good. No, I mean she. The think? hair and makeup always looked. She always looked camera ready, fresh, and completely pulled together. She never looked tired for all of that lack of sleep, all of that travel. She didn't look haggard. She didn't look like it was aging her. She seemed to be rejuvenated toward the end and, and look even better at the very end. Well, I, think I thought that was all very interesting. Uh, and maybe Michelle Obama even sort of alluded to it. The idea that for a lot of the male candidates, it's a matter of getting up, putting on a suit and out the door you go. And, mm-hmm. you know, as a, a woman, you know, she had to worry about makeup and the, and the hair and the accessories and a whole list of yeah, other Hillary things. Yeah, Hillary said that, that too. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but now, as they as people do the sort of uh, summing up and diagnosis the of where Hillary went wrong, the postmortems, yes, yes. Uh, uh, oh, there's a lot of talk about whether it was sexist, and you, I, I just have to talk to you about the subject of how it makes you feel uh, that all of these efforts to collect the evidence that there was some kind of a sexist, unfair, 
uh, attacking of her, uh, your name always comes up, and, and that column that you wrote last summer ab- about uh, seeing that she showed a little cleavage in the Senate uh, is on every list. It's like you've gone down in the history of sexism or something. This must be a very bizarre experience for you. Um, well, I have to say that I haven't been um, going over all the, the postmortems enough to... You don't have a Google alert on your name? <laughs> I haven't been Googling myself. I have a Google <laughs> alert on your name. I, I see what people say about you. You don't check what people say about you? Uh, I, I might try be smart. to avoid sliding down into that rabbit hole. No good can come no, of it. It's, it's no great fun. at all. Well, but, well, I hope I'm not uh, shocking you or surprising you when I say that all of these things that talk about sexism may always mention your column about the cleavage, as if that's just the worst thing anyone did. You know, I mean, um, I, I think that the... the the desire to go back and try and figure out where sexism existed and where it didn't. I think that's certainly um, a beneficial exercise. I think it's I think it's something that mm-hmm. needs to be done. But I also think that we really need to ask ourselves, um, you know, try to really understand what sexism is and and, right. and because it's a lot more complicated than just noticing what a woman is wearing. I mean, I certainly would argue that, you know, we don't want the idea of that we can look at men and women exactly the same and sort of see no gender, I think is just mm-hmm. as much of a fallacy as the quote unquote colorblind society. Because the reality is that there are differences and nuances and interesting aspects to people's cultural backgrounds and interesting Mm -hmm. aspects uh, related to gender. And I don't think that the idea is we want to annihilate that and ignore it. I think the... She also used gender. She chose to make gender a positive and to make arguments in her favor based on gender. So she put gender in play. She didn't say, we never talk about gender with respect to me. She deliberately put those things forward. Well, I think she was extraordinarily conflicted about gender throughout the campaign. I think there were moments when she wanted to celebrate it, and then there were moments when she wanted to say that it didn't matter, that no one should Mm -hmm. speak of it. I mean, I think that she wanted to have it in a multitude of different ways because she Mm -hmm. was, to some degree, uncomfortable with it. I mean, that's Mm -hmm. just my perception, but, you know, that that was kind of my takeaway, that this is not someone who was completely at ease. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, What was I going to say? So, uh, oh, I was going to say... On the cleavage issue, mm-hmm. uh, the, that um, if she had showed up at one of the debates with a shirt that showed some cleavage, even the tiniest bit, everyone would have talked about it. It would have been a huge deal. Everyone would have talked about it. You just happened to have noticed this uh, one speech sometime that was on uh, C-SPAN right. uh, that got called to you. So you wrote about it early, uh, and everyone acted like that was a terrible thing to even point out. But it seems obvious to me that if at one of these high-profile things, like one of the debates, she had worn a scooped uh, top that showed some cleavage, everyone would have, it would have been a huge deal. I, so the idea that uh, that it, it, it shouldn't even be mentioned and it's nothing and it all could just happen by accident, I think is absurd. Well, I, I do think that people would have noticed, and I think that it would have been something that, that would have been discussed. But I was actually mm-hmm. sort of fascinated by the the trajectory that the conversation took because it it quite mm. quickly went from a conversation about what she was wearing and whether or not there's some there can be something empowering about a woman mm. showing a little cleavage in that sort of situation. Mm-hmm. And it sort of mm-hmm. went into this whole sort of locker room conversation. Um, which you know, to me, said something, you know, sort of sad and disturbing about where we are culturally and just being able to have a conversation that touches on Mm -hmm. sex and gender and femininity and power and all those kinds of things. I mean, a lot of people, you know, are quite quick to say that as a culture, Americans 
are much more comfortable, you know, showing heads exploding on television than they are having yeah. an adult conversation about sexuality. Yeah. Well, I mean, on the subject of the Clintons, sex is a touchy subject because of the uh, Bill Clinton's uh, issues. So, I mean, once you make people start to think about sex with respect to the Clintons, it opens up the floodgates of things that are not helpful to her to have us think about. You know, I, I don't think that... So she had to keep to us from thinking those things. ...of, you know, cleavage to make people think about that history. I think that history is kind of, you know, the, the giant elephant that's people always been around. about it. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. I was going to ask you about the um, Sex and the City movie. I loved you liked it. it. I thought it was completely non-nutritious calories. It was a delight. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, do, do, you, do you mind that uh, these women have clothes and apartments and decor that are beyond the economics of their situation? Or is that sort of just like the way in porn people are always ready to have sex? It's just um, a convention of the genre. Just have fun with it. Don't ask those questions. I, you know, I don't want to see a group of women, you know, in New York, you know, in that sort of in the context of that storyline, living within their means. I don't want to mm -hmm. see a freelance mm -hmm. writer living in her little studio apartment with, you know, bargain yeah. shopping. I want... It was all about, you know, this very glossy, wonderful, glamorous fantasy of what New York is. I mean, the fact that these women were always overdressed for every occasion. I mean, they were, but in, were sequins to, you know, to their way. It was ridiculous. No one does that. But in, in, in real life, the kind of people that wear the sort of clothes that they have, they're just like not... They're not like that. I mean, they're not girlish and, and flighty, and they're, they're more um, rich. Uh, well, you know, I just I don't want to say that, that. You know, a lot of the reviews of that movie just sort of gave it a bad rap, rap that it didn't deserve. I mean, I don't know why so many people were ex expected a kind of reality that didn't exist mm -hmm. really in, in the television show itself. And, mm -hmm. you know, I think one of the things that made the show, the TV show, so successful was that it was rooted in the kinds of friendships that I think women mm -hmm. value. And if, if they don't have that kind of friendship, long for it. Yeah. I think yeah. that, you know, there was just the right amount of sort of melancholy and, and drama, you know, sort of real life drama of, you know, a parent dying or becoming infirmed or the inability, difficulty conceiving, mm -hmm. things like that. And it was wrapped in, you know, the kind of little girl fantasy of dressing up and princesses and Cinderella and all that completely unabashedly unembarrassed girly stuff. So, you, so you're not buying my porn analogy, <laughs> are you? Porn <laughs> uh, well, it was definitely fashion porn. It's I a think. kind of porn for women. I mean, you know, I I saw the movie here at uh, in Madison, Wisconsin. Um, we have this Sundance Theater here, which is you know beautiful uh, theater that uh, is the first of a project of Robert Redford. Now you and, didn't uh, see beautiful... it in an audience filled with you know like crunchy granola women's studies. No, this but is all very you know, but they weren't. Times. No, they weren't. That's what you would think in Madison. You would think they'd be crunchy Birkenstock wearing. Uh, you know, I know what you're picturing, but it was. Uh, we we went um, on uh, opening night, and uh, as we were driving up to the theater, uh, there were like hordes of young women converging on it, and they were like in groups of three and four. Yeah. And they were wearing these little sundresses, and I, we were like, "Where did these women come from?" It was sort of like they they were created by the movie, uh, but so they were you modeling themselves after the movie. I mean, who who wears a short skirt to, to go to the movies? I mean, you'd be sitting in the dark. What's that for? But they had gotten dressed up for it, and they, you know they were serving cosmopolitans at the theater, and uh, you know at the, we have this theater where you can take drinks in. I don't know. That's a new thing. But, uh, but uh, you know, they were really into it. And then the audience was full of these uh, women. Yeah. There were an occasional men, but full of these women. And the women were just, 
They were breathing and sighing along with every emotional moment. So it was like every, you know, if there was a dog, they would say, "Ooh." If there was a baby, every little setback or good thing, you know, you could just feel the group emotion rising and falling uh, with the with the storyline. Yeah, I mean, I, it was really weird. And and I one of the nice things, I mean, people have complained about how these women didn't really have; they had sort of careers in name only. Other than other than mm-hmm. Carrie, whose career is obviously a huge sort of part of the storyline, but you don't really see them. You know, the, the career doesn't. Really yeah, how come I to be a lawyer in a big firm? And, but the thing that I I love is that you know what these women they had careers, but their careers mm-hmm. were not their lives. The careers were just mm-hmm. sort of in the background, and all you knew is that they did well at them. And it really focused yeah. on, you know, their personal lives. It wasn't that, you know, inner office fighting and all that sort of thing. And you saw a little bit of but that. But that's like the classic. Landed, and I think that's fine. It's like the classic sitcom formula where that would always be the case with the men. Like, people always used to joke about how on Ozzy and Harriet, what was Ozzy's job? He never seemed to go to work. Or, or in some of the other family sitcoms of the early years of TV, the father would have a job that you would be informed of. But basically, he'd be in, it, it was the relationships, it was the family life uh, that mattered. And, you know. Yeah. It's you know, been it's- true in more recent years that there will be sitcoms about the workplace, but that actually is not the more common kind of sitcom. So the fact that they don't show them at work, I think, uh, isn't that unusual, is it? it you know, it's, I don't think it's that unusual, but I have read critiques where um, the argument is that these sort of, you know, independent women were reduced to their hunt for a male partner, for a husband or yeah. for a boyfriend. Yeah. And they weren't yeah. uh, well portrayed as these, yeah. you know, as, you know, from their That's from their So it's this feminist argument that they should show them at the workplace. But they haven't been showing men in the workplace, mostly. Most of the stories are about people's uh, relationships. I mean, for example, if you look at Seinfeld... That was all about their relationships. It wasn't so much about work. Did they? You hardly ever saw them at work. So, uh, you know, unless you're going to have a, the workplace as the main set of the story, right. you're not going to go off and show these people at work. Like Ralph Cramden drove a bus, but did you ever see him driving his bus? <laughs> no. Hmm. no. I don't think so. But, I mean, come on. Who could, who could not love some of those scenes with just these clothes that were just completely... Yeah, it was a great, um, that's why I think it's like porn. I mean, it was all, I mean, there were constantly, every every few minutes there'd be new clothes. There'd also be lots of furniture. Uh, the movie drove me crazy because in the scene when they're in the, I think it's the Vogue office with the one with Candace Bergen. Yeah. Um, they have this uh, Dorothy Draper chest of doors. It's black with gold uh, curvy trim on it. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you remember this, but it, it blew my mind because I have that chest. I huh. inherited it from my parents. And I was about to, you know, just get rid of it. I just thought it was junk. It was annoying me. <laughs> and I, and then, uh, and there it was in the movie. And now it's trendy. <laughs> but anyway, <basketball>. was, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, that's sort of this uh, weird thing. I, I, that's why I'm afraid to ever throw any clothes out. I feel like the minute I throw it out, it's going to be some vintage thing that I'll see everywhere and I'll kick myself for throwing it out. <laughs> So well, they always say that. that when it comes back, it never comes back in exactly the same way. Oh, so that's like you need more makeup to, to do very the... creative and recreate it. That's the commerce, though, right? You know, you're going to need a new, uh, you'll need a new version of it, so you might as well throw it out. When it comes back, it'll be different enough that you'll have to get a new one. Well, it's like the natural look takes more makeup. <laughs> well, you know, the, the great irony, of course, is that for, there was a huge chunk of time recently when the fashion industry was obsessed with vintage clothing and the Mm -hmm. idea of, you know, sort of using that for inspiration, but also, um, you know, stylists using vintage as a way of providing people with something that was very unique. So fashion was kind of working against its own best interests. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, they, we've cycled through all the past decades so many times. I always thought, oh, once they cycle through them, they'll have to come up with new things. But they just recycle. They just go back to a different decade. Well, Carrie wears a lot of vintage, <laughs> actually. So, yeah, so yeah. there you go. It's not all about commerce. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, it's not that much about showing you how to put things together or um, c- 
create, be creative or something like that. I mean, they're just wearing designer labels. They're even often telling you what designer it is. Oh, no, no, no. And au contraire, I beg to differ. I mean, there are lots of designer labels corrected. in the movie, but there are also some pretty inexpensive things in there as well. And certainly in the show, um, before it became as as mega popular as, as it did, mm -hmm. the stylist, Patricia Field, was really one of her, her trademarks is her mix of very high-end with low-end, with vintage finds, with just, you know, wacky things that she happens upon in a flea market. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's very good for a comedy, too, because there's a comic element to... Well, of course, some of the things Carrie wore, like those giant flowers, were, were kind of comic, weren't they? Or were we supposed to take that seriously? Well, I don't know. That they, weren't really, they weren't meant to be comic. They were meant to be extreme. Amusing. But, I mean, famously, don't, don't we say for instance, in the early part of the show, uh, she wore vintage fur and wore it mm -hmm. multiple times, and it sent a lot of people running out to search flea markets for vintage furs. And, you know, a lot of the signature pieces that became sort of trends, like the nameplate necklace, for instance, was something that yeah. Patricia Field sold in her store. And we're talking about a necklace that's, you know, less than $200. Yeah. And that necklace was a style from back in the 70s, I think. The well, wearing your own name on a necklace. Yeah, I always well, thought that was incredibly stupid. It, uh, worn by, you know, young girls who, you know, didn't necessarily live in Manhattan, but, you know, were coming in from Queens or from the Bronx. Exactly. And it was, yeah, like, it was, it was kind of a style. Yeah. 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 It was not, it was sort of a trashy, um, you know, out of it kind of a thing. So to make it, I guess there's something clever about making it, making something uh, that is a kind of not fashionable seem cool if, Everybody else stops wearing it or something. You could start wearing it. Well, I think the idea was to take something that doesn't come from some fancy designer's salon and cost thousands of dollars and be able to mm -hmm. make it just as desirable as, as something that, you know, that, that did. I want to bring back the topic of uh, fat with respect to sex in the city. You know, you they're so thin, fat? basically. <laughs> fat. Fat. Um, uh, I mean, there was this whole thing in the movie about uh, the uh, Samantha character mm -hmm. gaining weight, except... Uh, Not so it, much. The actress didn't gain any weight. She, there was nothing to see. And then they were acting shocked that she had gained this weight, and it was a whole huge issue uh, that this woman had gotten fat, but she, she wasn't fat. And meanwhile, Carrie's love of her life, uh, Chris Noth, uh, he's fat. <laughs> so it didn't make any sense to me this idea that we should be horrified by fat and here's this woman that we're supposed to be horrified by she isn't even fat no. uh, and here's this other person who's supposedly the big dream boat and, uh, and he's fat and no one ever says anything about it well you know and it seems like a double standard you're a lot tougher than I am I would not call Chris Knopf fat um, I thought he I've looked called... pretty darn good <laughs> I did. He did look good, but so you're, did uh, you're Kim Cattrall. You're brutal. Your standards are so high. <laughs> no, they're not really. But I just think uh, I think that the word "fat" is a real word, and things should be called by their real name. And you know, people. Are, I, I didn't say obese. I didn't say. Um, you know, yeah, no, I, is I just, fat a word you're not allowed to say? <laughs> well, you know, the thing the thing about Samantha and. Uh, you know, I don't think that anyone would have looked at her after she had supposedly gained, I think she said, 15 pounds, uh, and described her as fat. I mean, I, and when she comes in and she's got this teeny tiny little roll, I mean, it basically just looks like her pants are a size too small. A little too tight, but, yes. Yeah. I mean, I think it was supposed to kind of play into um, what longtime fans know about the character of Samantha which is that she mm -hmm. prided herself on her discipline and on how, you know, toned and sort of perfect her, her body always was. I mean, yeah. I seem to recall yeah. an episode when um, she opens the door and I, I want to say some guy compliments her on how great she looks and for whatever reason, she's naked. And, you know, she talks about, oh, you know, Pilates and this and that and the other thing. So I think in... Samantha's mind gaining 
15 yeah. pounds might have, you know, driven her to describe herself as being overweight and or being fat. But it, I, I, it was also symbolic that she was deprived of sex. So she had this voracious sexual appetite. But because she was deprived of sex in this monogamous relationship that she had, uh, she had this displaced hunger where she was eating food. And so the gaining of the me weight meant that she really needed to get back to having much more sex. Yeah, pretty much. That's how it worked in the movie. That was the cause and effect. I don't know if that makes any sense. So it was kind of symbolic of this hunger for, for sex that she, she was. So, so, so that was why uh, she was but getting she fat. I don't know. It was some kind of a... For, you know, variety in her sex life to variety in the yes. kind of food that yeah. she shoveled yeah. into her mouth. Yeah. That's the way they portrayed it. I mean, they were trying to be a comic about that. Combining eating and sex is something that's often done to comic effect in movies, you know, like in the old Tom Jones scene where they're eating and seducing each other and things like that. So it's a kind of a classic movie set piece to have uh, someone eating food and being sexually aroused and then uh, their consuming of the food is the sex that they're not having or it's what they can show on TV or <laughs> I don't know. It's sort of like in these porn this porn for women, they have the fashion, they have the eating, they have all these things that women like, but they don't have the actual, uh, they, they spare us the actual sex. So it's, it's like things for women, what they think we want, but apparently uh, people wanted it. Yeah, it seemed, it, the movie did really well, and I'm trying to think, did we, not, did we not see any actual sex in the movie? We saw lots of sex in the movie, didn't we? A little, a little. There was a thing in the closet. I don't know. Well, there was also there was the a lot neighbor. more eating. There was the indiscriminate yeah. sex. Oh, her. nudity! There was nudity. We saw the the man that she didn't have, so she was always eating food while looking at him. So that was, you know, I guess it was like right, masturbation. Right, right. Excuse the expression. And then I think I think Charlotte and um, Perry have a little yeah. roll in the bed. Although yeah. I wasn't taking notes, so I could be wrong on that. Yeah, yeah, and I think we I think we may. I think that they may put in a sex scene with each of the characters just to, you know, basically make the formal point that they are actually having sex. But the, the real porn of the movie is the clothes and the, and the uh, interior decoration. Well, someone and made food. a point of saying that in one of the most sort of graphic conversations about sex when they have to refer to it as coloring because um, oh, yeah. Charlotte's little girl is there. Um, you know... Uh, Carrie or Sarah Jessica Parker is is the one who won't essentially kiss and tell, who won't give mm -hmm. any details about um, the sex with Big. And I don't know, in some ways it almost seems like, you know, there's a distinction between what they consider to be sort of sex and conquests and entertainment versus this idea of something else that they didn't want to talk about so much and this idea mm -hmm. of intimacy and romance which i think mm -hmm. is sort of implied by the fact that you know the carrie character won't dish about the bedroom with big mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah yeah there's a lot to appeal to I, I guess they were successful in appealing to women on a lot of those elements hey we went over an hour uh -oh. so i'm thinking we're <laughs> running out of time we are, I mean, nothing happens. They don't cut us off, but, but we are supposed to keep a little to the hour, so oh, I might have to call time on us. It was great talking to you. Is there anything else you'd like to say? Anything we didn't get to? Oh, well, so we're, we're just uh, empty now, so uh, <laughs> we'll, <laughs> we'll have to wait. You know, I have to apologize. If I look like I'm looking around, like I'm not paying attention sometimes, I'm, I'm looking out into the treetops uh, in, in, in my yard, and there's like cardinals flying everywhere these bright red huh. uh, birds they're very pretty so well, it's not really a fashion but legitimate distraction <laughs> if i sometimes look around in, a, in an odd way i'm, I'm watching uh, there are these bright red cardinals flying around outside my outside my window lovely. and i hope uh, you're having a lovely uh, scenery there in new york city how was New York? I was living in New York for a while. Um, you know, but today is back. not a good New York day. It's very muggy. So yeah. the city yeah, on, yeah, the city on a York, muggy isn't? day is not a good thing. Yeah, yeah. The subway yeah. on a muggy it's day tough. is not a pleasant place. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah. That's hard. Okay. But anyway, well, it's been a pleasure as always. 
Yeah, it was great to talk to you. Take care. So, you too. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>